We are parents, teachers, and educators. And like you, we're passionate about restoring our culture for Christ. This is Veritas Vox, the voice of classical Christian education. Hello again, this is Marlon Detweiler with Veritas Vox, the voice of classical Christian education. Today we have someone with us that I've known for decades, Gary DeMar. Gary, welcome. Good to be with you. Gary, uh, uh, give us a little bit of uh, your background personally before we jump into some uh, other things. Um, I was uh, raised in suburbs of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, raised Roman Catholic, I went to Catholic school up through fifth grade. Um, and ended up um, spending most of my time, unfortunately, in, in athletics and uh, ended up going to Western Michigan University on a scholarship for track and field. Uh, became a Christian my senior year in college in, um, in 1973 and uh, ended up moving down to Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Uh, the, the job situation in Pittsburgh was not very good in the 1970s. Right. So I ended up in Fort Lauderdale, Florida and providentially moved within a few blocks of Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church where D. James Kennedy was the pastor. And uh, it was a that was a very unique church. Um, not, not only was D. Well, James I Kennedy... Did at the forefront of evangelism, he, he developed and promoted the evangelism explosion program, uh, which I and my, 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 my future wife, uh, you know, participated in. We were both members there. We didn't know one another at, at the time, but at the same time, he was a worldview guy. I mean, he had, he had started a, a Christian Academy. Uh, so he was really involved in, in Christian education, uh, biblical worldview issues, spoke on worldview issues, uh, held conferences on them as well. And uh, my short term there, I ended up at Reformed Theological Seminary in Jackson, Mississippi, graduated in 1977. I got um, in involved in the apologetics side of Christian worldview. Greg Bonson was a professor there uh, and probably the premier Christian apologist of the of the of 20th century. Yeah. And uh, moved to the Atlanta area, taught school here for a little while, and uh, started working at American Vision in 1980. I've been there in there ever since, although there was a short hiatus uh, where I I retired, and then they 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 they, they forced pulled me back in. So they I've been I'm, back in. Tell us so. what American. Now that you're based in uh, uh, northern part of Atlanta, uh, right. tell us about American Vision. What does it do? American Vision was started by a fellow named Steve Schiffman, and some some of your your listeners and viewers might uh, uh, might have known Marshall Foster. Uh, Marshall Foster, uh, who was really big in the America's Christian History side of things, um, and uh, he and Steve Schiffman had a little falling out, and they went their separate ways. Steve was here in the Atlanta area. He had done some ministry work before he had started American Vision, which was uh, pretty much centered in on America's Christian heritage. And then we did a, a, a uh, audio thing called the American Vision 360 Years Later that actually won an award. It was an audio presentation of America's Christian history beginning through Columbus all the way up to then the present 1980s. Uh, and I wrote a, then I wrote a book uh, called God and Government. It was the first of three volumes on what the Bible said about government. Now, remember, this is the 1980s. And... Uh, we just finished with Jimmy Carter being president, which was seen by many to be a disaster. Ronald Reagan comes on the scene. And my goal was to help Christians understand how the Bible applied to government and showing that government was, synony was not synonymous with politics. Yeah. And uh, the book sold very, very well. Uh, they wrote a second volume, and wrote a third volume, and we've now combined it into one volume just called God and government, biblical, historical, and constitutional. I remember when that came out, and I also, there was a periodical that you sent out with some really intriguing and thought-provoking articles. What was that called? I was called Biblical Worldview Magazine. And we, yeah, we, we, we did that monthly, but with the internet, uh, you know, I, I write now uh, you know, two articles a week rather than, you know, the putting a magazine out, which was expensive to do. Right. I write two articles a week. I do three podcasts a week. Uh, and then I have another uh, series of podcasts that I do with a, with a seminary friend of mine, which we're dealing with eschatology. 
So I keep busy in that area. And the American Vision also publishes a, a great variety of books on apologetics, America's Christian history, um, eschatology, uh, uh, government, worldview thinking, et cetera. So we, we, we do quite a bit in the worldview side of things. Yeah, you, you do great work. And for people that are listening that aren't familiar with you, I really want to encourage them to look you up and become uh, more familiar because uh, you, you just do uh, some remarkable uh, thought-provoking uh, articles and, and conversation. And I enjoy your Facebook uh, posts as well, which can be very uh, provocative. I'm reminded that there is a philosophy that you have about what you write, especially in smaller segments. Remind us all what that is. You know what I'm referring to? Oh, the uh, don't give anyone a reason to reject your position other than the position itself. Yes, that's it. I, I think that is incredible wisdom. Uh, and uh, I think... Uh, it, it really uh, uh, resonates with me. As you get- as and, and, and Marlon, I learned that the hard way. <laughs> Two uh, reasons. Yeah, go ahead. I, I had some very good friends who were brilliant, brilliant people, but oftentimes their personalities and their approach to things got in the way of their very, very good arguments. Yeah. So I learned from that and also from making my own mistakes. And I'll, I'll, I'll add something else to this. Uh, having a good wife to remind me what an idiot I am sometimes and then listening, <laughs> listening to her wise counsel. So, uh, so it's, you know, and I try to, I try to teach young people this as well. I said, your, your demeanor, the way you say things, your approach that you take gets in the way of your good arguments because people will find almost any excuse to, to reject a, reject a position and don't give them any make yeah. force them to force them to deal with, deal the, with, position. Deal with the position. I think that is so, so wise as we have uh, a political season coming up and uh, it seems like every time this happens, we could say this is the most unusual, most important, uh, most significant election season for the um, preservation of America as we know it. But what's the truth? And wh what do you think about the upcoming political season? Well, uh, since we don't know what the future is and we do know what the past is, we can say that this one is really, really crucial. They have all been crucial, but this one, because now we are kind of a, a really a 50-50 nation here. We're, and, and, what we as Christians and conservatives in general decide to do is going to determine the fate of the nation, especially when you have, um, well, a, a president who I think is being manipulated by, by, by very powerful special interest groups. Right. I don't think he is in charge as much as people think he is in charge and he's, he's being somewhat manipulated. I think every, you know, every um, um, politician and businessman goes through this. I don't know if you saw the, there's a story about the uh, president of, of Disney telling DeSantis that the, the reason he, the reason he made, made the decisions he did was all the pressure that he got from a lot of these, these other groups. So everybody is in that position. Everybody's in that position to keep their job, to get reelected. And so they make compromises in order to satisfy uh, certain groups, and that, that's on the conservative side as well. I, and I don't want to even say conservative side on the Republican side, yep. uh, because politics, you know, power and money are corrupting influences. And I don't care what political party you're involved in, yep. uh, they are instrumental in driving people's opinions and actions. And we as Christians have to be aware of that. And even though one political party is probably a little better than the other, there's still problems within that better political party that need to be dealt with as, as those who believe in a, a full orb Christian worldview. Yeah. Um, with regard to uh, uh, worldview and end times, or what we call eschatology, there was uh, uh, a notable increase in conversation and expectation that we are living in the last days. I, I remember seeing it on Facebook, especially in 2020 when we were in lockdowns with COVID and probably even to 20, into 2021. 
You have worked a lot in eschatology. You have impacted me a lot in eschatology. Talk to us about the subject and why, what you believe and why you believe it. Well, eschatology is a fancy name for you know, studying the things related to the future. In particular, biblical eschatology deals with very specific uh, uh, prophetic events that people claim refer to the end of history. And the reason I got into this was when I wrote the God and Government series back in the 1980s. And you know, think of that. That was that was 40 years ago. <laughs> and I know, I know, I know. You have gray hair. You have more hair than I do. But, yeah. we, you know, we were a lot younger. I, yours is um, the same color, but I can hardly tell that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, and so when I when I would go out and speak on the whole God and Government issue, invariably there'd be somebody in the audience would say, Oh, but, you know, we're living in the last days, all the signs, all the, all the signs seem to be pointing to that. And so I had to address that that subject. Remember, this is, it was 1982, Hal Lindsey's The Late Great Planet Earth came out in 1970. Right. And that book sold in the neighborhood of about 28 million copies. Oh, my think word. The yeah, you I think I left knew it was a big seller. I didn't know it was that much. Wow. Yeah, it was that much. Yeah, it was. They, they said it was the number one. Um, and it all depends on how you define nonfiction. It was supposedly the, the number one nonfiction book of the 1970s, um, uh, even uh, even beating out some some uh, uh, sex book that came out come out came out that year. So to give you some idea of in the 1970s how popular the eschatology was. Uh, and leading up to what a lot of people believe was going to be the end um, sometime in the 1980s. Uh, there's, there's a new film that's come out called Jesus Revolution. I don't know if you're familiar. I haven't familiar seen with. it yet. I'm familiar with it. Yeah. It's, got, it's, it's, it's gotten some very good reviews. And it is the history of the Jesus movement of the late 60s, early 70s yeah. with Chuck Smith and a, and a couple of other people. And it's got some big names in it. Kelsey Grammer's in it. I graduated high school in 74, had a sister that graduated in 69, and she would have been more firmly planted in the middle of that, I think. Maybe not. It probably was, well, yeah, the middle is probably 70 to 72, wasn't it? Um, but yeah, I remember that well. Most of our audience probably is a little young for that. Yeah, and it's uh, and, you know, Chuck Smith, uh, Greg Laurie, uh, there's another fellow, I can't remember his his, his name, who's no, it was you know, ended up dying re relatively early in the night in the 1970s, uh, but it was a huge, huge movement. But one of the one of the the aspects of that movement was it was an eschatological mm -hmm. uh, 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 tint to it, and that we were living with in in the end times. Uh, and Chuck Chuck Smith, who died a few years ago, uh, wrote a, a great number of books on this particular topic. And going back to Hal Lindsey's book, Hal Lindsey, you know, stated in his book uh, that Israel becoming a nation again was was uh, prophetically significant, and that took place in 1948. And he went to Matthew 24, 34, says this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. He said a generation was 40 years. Well, you can do the math. Even somebody who doesn't have Veritas press books, they can they can do the math. 1948 plus 40 gave you 1988. <laughs> and so Chuck Smith, I mean, came out very specifically telling people that we were, in fact, living in the end times yeah. and the rapture of the church was going to take place between this 1981, 1988 time period. Uh, and that was that's the basis of the whole Left Behind series. And sure enough, not only do you have the Jesus Revolution movie coming out, but you had a reboot of the Left Behind series uh, that came out in, in February. Uh, and this is actually the third the third attempt that the left behind. I think the first attempt um, was uh, Kirk Cameron. Uh, Kirk Cameron was in the first three, and then um, uh, Nicholas Cage was in the second one, and then Kevin Sorbo, I think, is in this in this uh, third one. So pro Bible prophecy is a huge, huge deal, and it still is. Uh, but if you study the history of prophetic speculation, you begin to see that nearly every generation saw that their generation was the final generation and all the things that were supposed to happen before the end times 
were taking place in their generation. And here we are again doing the same thing. Right. And a lot of people just don't have a concept of history to see that things today, I know things look bad today, uh, but remember we in world, you know, my, my father, he was in World War II in the Korean War. Of course, he had World War I and the rise of communism, the rise of Nazism. Right. You had a French Revolution before that. You go all the way through history, you had plagues that killed yeah. tens of millions of people. Uh, in fact, I just read an article today about people claiming that the uh, hurricanes and so forth, are there, there are more of them and they're more intense than they've ever been. Well, this report comes out and says, actually, they're not. Yeah. And the same thing with earthquakes. They're better we, reported. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, here's the thing. You, look what you and I are doing here right now. Yeah, exactly. You're up in, you're up in Pennsylvania. I'm down no, here. No, I'm in Florida. <laughs> okay, you're in. Okay, all right. I see you got your golf shirt on, so you're all set. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, okay, you're down in Florida. I'm up here in Marietta. You're you got uh, you know. There's another guy on the phone somewhere, somewhere else. We get information immediately, yeah. immediately. From all over the world, there's some we are so inundated with information that we we can't handle. It's like a fire hose, right. and it's the same thing with all these events that take place today that people don't have a real historical and logical perspective of, of, of it all. So I <clears throat> I deal with the I deal with a biblical approach to it. What does the Bible say about eschatology? And because ultimately it comes down to that. Well, let's talk about that. And I want to set the stage for it a bit. I, I literally, just a couple hours prior to this, was at an early morning men's, it's a Bible reading. We go around, the um, the attendees at the table go around and read significant portions of a prescribed uh, uh, section of scripture and then discuss it. And one of the guys, in light of the discussion, made a comment that was clearly about Jesus coming back soon, premillennialism. And this is a conservative Presbyterian church, one that is uh, people of the word, theologically astute. And there was no comment to address it. Now, I'm going to guess that uh, there is more than one reason, and, but what, one of the reasons is because there's not uh, this overwhelming majority consensus of that eschatology. Why is and so you've well, I don't need to ask the question why you've already mentioned it, uh, that it's been the case always. Tell us why you don't believe that and what you do believe. Well, when I first became a Christian, uh, like I said, I became a Christian in 1973. Al Lindsay's Late Great Planet Earth was big. Um, and in, in fact, uh, I ran into an old high school friend in Ann Arbor, Michigan, when I was competing in a, in a, in a track meet there, an indoor track meet. And he brought up Late Great Planet Earth. And I didn't know anything about the Bible. Uh, and he sounded convincing. He's an intelligent guy. And uh, But m my life was kind of going downhill at that point. I wasn't so much interested in eschatology, but I was interested in this new life in Christ. And I was never an atheist. I just didn't know how to put it all together. So okay. anyways, I went went back uh, to, to Kalamazoo, to Western Michigan. The only the only thing I had in my in terms of a Bible was my father's uh, uh, New Testament, a little New Testament they always took with him. You know, Roosevelt had his, was a kind of a prayer in the beginning of it. And that was all I had. So I started reading the Gospel of Matthew, and I got to a number of passages in the Gospel of Matthew, uh, the Matthew chapter 10, verse 23, uh, you will not finish going through the cities of Israel until the, until the Son of Man comes. I thought, wait a minute, that, that doesn't fit with what I've been hearing. And then I got to Matthew 16, 27, and 28, and says, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And I didn't know how to I didn't know how to fit that in. Then I got to Matthew chapter 24, which is the big, big chapter. Yep. Matthew 24, actually, you're going to read the, the eschatological significance of Matthew 24. You really got to start, you really have to start with Matthew 21, 22, 23. 23 is really the background for Matthew chapter 24. So I started reading Matthew 24, and it says, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. And for I so many, it's been written thousands of years ago. Yeah. It's 
it's relevant at this moment, historically speaking. It, I don't understand. Yeah, and 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 if you look at Matthew 11 and 12, you would see that Jesus was using the phrase "this generation" to apply to their generation. Right. But he, so, but here I was, a brand new Christian. I mean, I mean, brand spanking new. I mean, right, right out of the wrapping, you know, wrapping paper, <laughs> Christian. And I didn't know any. I didn't know anything about the Bible, so I I kind of put it on the shelf because I was getting my getting my act together essentially. And I ended up going to seminary, which I would not recommend this to anybody. Uh, but I was a, here I was a Christian for about a year and someone recommended I go to seminary. And he, I mean, uh, that was, a, you know, Greek, you know, Greek, Hebrew, all this, all this stuff. That, I mean, I was talking about, a, you know, uh, the fish out of water. That was me. I, I, I didn't know anything. Um, but I came across a book, the librarian, Mr. Wagner, it was selling some of his, of his library. And there was a little red book and it just had on the spine, Matthew 24. And I, I bought it. I picked it up and it was by a fellow named Marcellus Kick, K-I-K. -K. Marcellus Kick was very prominent in conservative Christian circles. Um, he was editor. I think he was an editor or, or assistant editor of Christianity Today. Uh, re reformed uh, reformed in, in terms of theology. A sharp, sharp guy. And I started reading it and uh, it was simply a verse by verse exposition of Matthew 24. And so I'm reading through this and I'm going, wait, well, this makes perfect sense because here I am in seminary now being told that you have to use the Bible to interpret the Bible. And that's what Kick was doing. He did, this generation will not pass away and all these things take place. He took me to other places in the New Testament where this generation was used, this generation applied to that particular generation. Therefore, it must, it must be used in the same way here. So to make a long story short, out of that, uh, since I wasn't really steeped in the whole end time, left behind, late great planet Earth stuff, it was not a was was not a difficult transition for me to make. And over time, I began to find out that this was a pretty common position that Matthew twenty four, Mark thirteen, Luke twenty one referred to events leading up to and including the destruction of Jerusalem in AD seventy, which is a historical event. Right. That I mean, there's no doubt that that happened. There's no doubt that not one stone was left unturned. Jesus predicted what happened in Matthew chapter 24. There's no doubt uh, that you know tens of thousands of Jews were were killed. There's no doubt that there was a the, Jesus had a warning, told them that this was going to happen, told them to flee the flee the city, flee Jerusalem. This is hardly a, a universal global event. If you can escape on foot by going to the mountains outside of Judea. Uh, there's, you know, you got people on flat roofs, um, you know, um, the Sabbath is still, is, is still in, is still in use. You know, at the book of Acts talks about a Sabbath day's journey. And so I, it just, it just changed my whole perspective on the end times, but I never, I didn't, I didn't use it for anything until I wrote the God in government. And I saw people doing what, you know, you you saw at this the Bible reading place. Somebody brings up this thing about we're living in the end times, and uh, and so I would say there two, two things happen. Number one, you've heard this enough that you probably agree with the guy, and number two, you couldn't refute him if you tried because most people can't. Right. Uh, and so, uh, but this is, I can. I, I've 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 heard every argument possible. I know what they all are. Uh, and it can be heated sometimes, but I learned my lesson. But a reason to reject your position other than the position itself. Yeah. And I kept pushing that. I said, well, okay, give me a verse that says, hey, uh, the temple has to be rebuilt. And I said, well, give me a verse in the New Testament that says the temple has to be rebuilt, is, that it's going to be rebuilt. There isn't one. Give me a verse that says the church is going to be taken off the earth, either before, during, in the middle of, or after a seven-year period. Give me a verse in the New Testament that says that. Well, most people, most people have never heard those questions asked of them, and therefore they're not able to answer the questions. Um, and, and now that doesn't mean that people on the other side don't have an answer for it. Right. But you know, but if you're if you're interpreting the Bible by using the Bible, uh, you know, those are important questions. So, Absolutely. Yeah, really so, uh, so anyway, that's that's how I think, and I think. And how all this fits into everything, I think are a lot of one of the reasons we're kind of in the mess we're in today 
that too many Christians believe we are living in the last days. There's not much we can do to change anything. Why polish and we don't brass? need to change anything because we're out of here. We're going to be out of here. Why polish brass on a sinking ship? Why rearrange the deck chairs yeah. on the Titanic? I mean, this is really, this is, I, I think a lot of Christians have just completely bowed out of the system, so to speak, because uh, for two reasons. One, there's an eschatological reason to it. And the other reason is they don't believe that they should be involved in things beyond the individual spirituality of the Christian life. Yeah. So can you take maybe just a minute or two and tell us what you do believe about the future? What do you believe the scriptures teach? Well, I I, I believe that uh, let me give you a, give you two verses. Uh Matthew 24, 14 says the gospel must be must be preached in the whole world to all the nations before the end comes. Now people read that passage and they say, See, what we need to do is continue to preach the gospel to the world. And once that's done, the end's going to come. But when you look at that passage in context, I mean, this is that Matthew 24 passage, verse 34 says, this generation will not pass away if all these things take place. When you take that Matthew 24, 14 passage apart, Jesus is not describing the end of the world there, because up in the third verse, he's talked about the end of the age, the end of the old covenant age was going to take place before that generation passed away. Right. And the gospel there that was said to be preached in the whole world, you, here you need a little little bit of, uh, you really don't need Greek, but I'm going to tell you what the Greek is anyway. The word there for world you would think would be cosmos, like for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Yep. But the word that's used there is uh, oiku, oikumene. You find you see the word oikos there, and it's not a yogurt. It's the word for house. Uh, and so like e oikonomics is the lawful ordering of, of a house. So the Greek word oikos. It's the same Greek word that's used in Luke 2.1, that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that the whole oikumene be, be taxed. Well, Rome would have loved to have taxed the whole cosmos, but all they could do was to tax their own empire, and the Greek word there is oikumene. It's the same Greek word used in Matthew 24. And yet when you go through the, Paul's epistles, and you will find that in, in Paul's epistles, in fact, there's one place where he says that the gospel had been preached to every creature under heaven in his day. Now, that's obviously hyperbole, but that particular verse there deals with the gospel going out to the then known world as a witness to the nations that the Messiah had come. That's what that verse means. Now you go to Matthew 28. Matthew 28 talks about going into all the world and making disciples of the nations. Sure. And that's a different, that's a different emphasis. Uh, and that's a different command. And I think that's where we are today. We aren't just to go out and preach the gospel to people so that that's an indication once we do that, Jesus is going to return. No, our goal is to do what, you, what you're doing. You're making disciples of people. And by making disciples of people, they disciple their families, their right. businesses, and their, right. their churches, and hopefully their world and the world in which they live. That's, that's the biblical command. And I believe... I believe that's not only a possibility, but I think that's an inevitability. Yeah. Uh, but we can't do it just by sitting back. It takes work, kind of the work I do, kind of the work you do, kind of the work that other Christians are doing out there. They need to have a broader, it was, it was I think it was J.B. J. B. Phillips uh, wrote a book called Your God is Too Small. And th this was years ago. And it was a great, great title. And I believe there are people... They think that their God is too small, but Satan is too big, and we we got this we got this mixed up. And uh, God has given us a command to disciple the nations. And so when you bring somebody to Christ, you don't leave them in a state of babyhood, but you raise them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. You look at Second Timothy chapter three. Timothy was trained in the in God in God's word by his grand grandmother and his mother. Uh, this is what we're supposed to. This is what we're supposed to do, and we're supposed to teach them what the Bible says about everything, not just little bits and pieces. So yeah. that's, that's, oh, that, that's, that is that is wonderful. Yeah, that's why we think it's so important to have this investment in 
classical education because we think we're training people in the best possible way, training children, in order to take dominion as we were told to do in Genesis. Uh, and uh, to me, that is so exciting. And uh, we have a lot of premillennial folks uh, in our program, but I sure hope they'll listen to you uh, here and, and be impacted by what you've said. Uh, we've run out of time, but there's one other thing I wanted to cover. You mentioned in a couple instances your involvement in track and field, and I don't have to ask you questions, and I uh, and I don't want to embarrass you, but I know something about you. You were the state champ in high school in Pennsylvania in the shot put, yeah, and you, yeah. and you set the state record uh, for Pennsylvania that held for a long time. And I hope you're not surprised that I remember this. You trained the guy that beat you. Beat I did. You yes, I did. Yeah. I he think threw, that was, uh, I think such a great story. Yeah. He and this this fellow um, uh, was he was the state champ in Pennsylvania for three years, three years wow. in a row. Was the was the first person in the state of Pennsylvania to throw 70 feet in the shot. Anybody, any kid out there has ever thrown. I'm, I'm by the way, Marla, I'm still coaching. There's a Christian school nearby. I still coach. And I'm trying to get the, I'm trying to get these guys to just throw 40 feet. I said 40, 40 feet. I pulled a tape measure out to I said 64 feet. And I said, I want you to look at look at me and say, okay, that's how far I threw. And <laughs> uh and you know, anyway, Ron ended up throwing 70 feet. In fact, if you look online, the junior college record uh and in, in the shot, he still holds it. Uh is that right? Ron S E M K I W. So he was the first. He was the first kid to throw seventy feet with a twelve pound shot, and seventy feet with a sixteen pound shot. He was the first one, you know, to do that. And he wasn't a real. He wasn't a tall guy. He was only like five eleven, but he was unbelievably strong. Could bench press four hundred thirty five pounds in high school. Wow. Um. Uh. Just. Uh. Just. Anyway. But yeah, that's what I did. I still do it. And. Uh, I did some master's track and field. But I, I have like, seen your backyard and your training area. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, uh, but those those types of, I keep telling people, these types of lessons in life end up helping you much, much later in life, which they have with me as well. Yeah. Folks, you have uh, been listening to Gary DeMar of American Vision, and you've been on, we've been with us on Veritas Vox, the voice of classical Christian education. Thank you for joining us.